Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be there and to meet uh, mamas, uh, people, and to meet Zagreb. And um, I'm very happy to be read, too. <laughs> you know, it's not so frequent. Um, so I begin by maybe reading with you um, the, the note, the introductory note of the session about uh, uh, the power, sophistry, the powers of the false. And I'm sorry to speak English because I don't speak English, I speak Globish. And all my work is against Globish. So uh, I am a contradiction, a living contradiction. But it's for, not for truth's sake, I think. <laughs> it's for, well, friendship's sake. So um, in this note, um, it's said that uh, it's a question of true and false. And that false is the shadow cast by the light of truth. And that what import is that um, those powers, those powers of the false, are co-constitutive of the truth. And I just want to underline one sentence that is for me problematic, but I won't uh, deal with it. I, I, it's just the, the way the question is open for me, you know. To approach sophistry from this perspective is not to indulge relativism. For me, the, the point where I'm working on now is how to make a consistent relativism. Why? All of say, oh, I don't want to indulge relativism. Why want to indulge relativism? Okay. So, um, for me, you see, the, the question of relativism, if set like that, is a, a kind of Platonism new look. Um, uh, Nietzsche goes further when he said, with the word truth, with the word truth, avec le monde vérité, nous avons aussi aboli le monde des apparences. We also abolished the word of appearances. So let us try not to make this cut between truth and false, even to uh, put false uh, or to put truth under the power of false. I don't mind who is winning, you know, which is winning. I mind to keep this split cease. So um, when, when I say it's, maybe it's a new a kind of new look Platonism, um, I am thinking of Badiou, uh, which is a, a very, very close friend, and with whom I work a lot during years, you know, and we are absolutely uh, uh, in, a, in a kind of fight. But also, we, we are, um, of course, in a, in a super esteem, okay? But when Badiou says that, um, oh, when I see that... Um, uh, force could be, powers of force could be co-constitutive of the truth. I'm immediately thinking of Badiou's way of uh, dealing with sophistry. <coughs> and I, I, I made a quotation in conditions uh, in the handout you have. Sorry. Um, Philosophy must never give, away, give way to anti-sophistical extremism. When it, nourish, when it nourishes the dark desire to do away with the sophist, once and for all, philosophy goes astray. This is precisely what defines dogmatism, in my view, claiming that the sophist should not exist simply because he is a perverse twin of the philosopher. No, says Badiou, the sophist must simply be a signet to his place. But that's the point. I don't agree. I don't know what is his place, and certainly not under the power of truth. And um, uh, it's, to my sense, exactly the same, because our discussion with Badiou could um, go to the, to the point, he is a man and I am a woman. He is a philosopher, he is Plato, and I am a sophist. And this I don't agree neither, you see. And 
but I don't know how I don't agree, but I know I don't agree. And um, uh, when Malabu says that uh, woman's task, and I quote also change from change of difference, it may be true that women do not invent any philosophical question, huh? but they create problems. Wherever they can, they put a spoke in the wheel of philosophers and philosophical systems. Thereby, the impossibility of being a woman becomes the impossibility of philosophy itself. I don't agree either. Uh, I think I, it's possible to be a woman. I think it's possible uh, to uh, do something to philosophy, but it's possible also to do something else than philosophy when you philosophize. Mm. So this is the relativism, you know, um, let me say the, the, the um, superperiension of relativism, of sophistry, of force, of woman, all that di kind of dialectical thing I don't want. So what else? What can we do? We can make a shift. That's, and you said it very well, that's the point. How to make a shift from this problematic of uh, um, dichotomies, even if you uh, put uh, one of the term better and uh, uh, new, uh, renew it, uh, but still two terms. Well, what can you do? Well, the shift for me uh, now is to be taken in the notion of performance. Performance, sorry, I did. performance, performance. <laughs> And, um, well, this will be too, uh, too long a story, but I mean that there, there are already shifts like that in the uh, antique tradition, especially in people who call them rhetors, but rhetors not, uh, not in the way Plato was seeing the rhetorics, in another way. And rhetors that are something else than well, or that outrepass, that depass, trespass the difference between rhetoric and philosophy, just like uh, the difference between force and truth. So Cantillon is one of the best examples, and I just give you uh, a sentence that makes me uh, um, have a long time thought of. Philosophia enim simulari potas, potest, eloquentia non potest. You can um, simulate, you can imitate philosophy, but you cannot imitate eloquence. Very interesting. Hmm? And uh, let me start in my real start, that is this sentence of Austin, uh, who at the end of how to do things with words, say, uh, to, I, I, I wish to, I want to play old Harry with two fetishes, which I admit to an inclination to play old Harry with, the true false fetish, the value fact fetish. That's my point. That's my point of departure. And um, the next sentence, I leave to my readers the real form of applying it in philosophy. I don't know if it's real fun, but let us try. Hmm? Let us try to do that. So let us try to think the difference, to, th to think the, uh, how do you say, congé, um, uh, to the difference between truth and false by the way of the notion of performance. Okay? So that's my point. And now I try to, to uh, to, I don't know, to, to explore that. Um, my first point will be the notion of epideixis. Epideixis is the name of uh, sophistic discursivity. It's the name, the uh, name that Plateau gave to sophistic discursivity in all his dialogues. And epideixis, well, first, how is it made, this word? 
epideixis, deixis, you know, what's deixnumit, show, hmm? and epi, it's more, under, um, super, super deixis. It's a super menstruation. Apodexis is the contra con contrasting word, means dexis, menstruation, and apodi, uh, going out of. So apodexis is the always pheno phenomenological, ontological way of uh, speaking, the demonstration. Platonico Aristotelian. Huh? Apo to phenomenu, coming out of the phenomenon, it's the demonstration that, could, that is at the end the only logical, ontological thing to do that a philosopher can do. And epidexis is absolutely another gesture. It's not that one, it's that one. And and, uh, but that one with that one too, that's strange. Um, epi means you show more and uh, you show yourself more and you show more of the thing and you show not from the thing but above the thing. And the thing is the product of your show. This is the whole uh, meaning of epideixis. Epideixis has a very specific rhetorical meaning that is um, encomium, <coughs> praise. Hmm? It's one of the possibilities of rhetoric in Aristotle, one of the rhetorical uh, uh, form, okay? You have, uh, you know, uh, um, Procès, procès, trials, uh, uh, deliberation, and praise. So, epideixis is this strange way, absolutely non-philosophical. Non I will be very um, cautious with the negations. Everything is, if, because if you, of course, every negation is an affirmation. Or nobody, uh, everybody knows that. So, uh, if you say it's not a demonstration, no, of course, it's a demonstration that is not a demonstration, but this is something else, okay? So, it's something else, an a apodexis, an a privative or no, something else. So, the epideixis is not a demonstration and something like a praise. The first example of uh, epideixis is the praise of Helen, Gorgias praise of Helen. You know that uh, Gorgias uh, came one day in Athens and uh, uh, for an embassy, it was a political purpose, and um, he says, well, uh, tomorrow I will make uh, this course, an epideixis uh, performance. It's a very good translation. I will make it a performance. And uh, on Monday morning, on the Agora, he made a performance saying that Ellen was the most guilty of women and everybody was very satisfied and it was just the usual doxa. And he says, see you tomorrow morning. And the, on Tuesday morning, on the Agora, Gorgias made an epideixis, a performance saying that uh, Helen is absolutely innocent. Praise of Helen. And it's not only a two contradictory speeches. The fact is that he produces an antidoxa Helen. He produces a new Helen, Helen of Troy, a new Helen that, for example, Euripides put in uh, its play Helen. Helen in Euripides is no more guilty. She is, uh, she is a phone. She is a sound. She is uh, a pombos. She is 
just her name. There is, there is two Helens in Helens, in Heuripedus Helens, and the Helen body, uh, the real, true, authentic Helen body, hmm, who is in Egypt and never been, and has never been with Paris, and never been in Troy, and uh, has never been unfaithful to her husband. But she is not very convincing. She is not very real, even if it's uh, flesh and body. The one who is very real is the one who make the effect of the, this terrible effect of making kill uh, half the Greece and uh, during 20 years and uh, being in Troy and uh, you know all the struggle about her, Homer. But this is nothing but her name. Just her name came on Troy. And it's for her name, more real than her body, that uh, Greek die. This is extraordinary when you are thinking of it. And when you are putting the praise of Helen, Gorgias' praise of Helen, and Euripides' Helen, and then you could put off and back and all what you want, you know. But the innocence of Helen is a question of which is more real, the name or the thing? The name is more real because it's, it has more effect. It is more effective. This is the whole scenery when you cross it quickly. So let me begin by the two first sentences of uh, Praise of Helen, and you will see the movement. Uh, I gave them um, at the end of first, page one, beginning of page two. The first sentence, order for a city's being well manned, for a body, beauty, a soul, wisdom, a, a thing, excellence, and for a discourse, truth. Order is cosmos, of course. Their opposites are disorder, as acosmia. Man, woman, discourse, work, city, thing, when praiseworthy, one must honor them with a, prize, with a praise, when unworthy, apply them a blame. For to blame the praiseworthy and to praise the blameworthy is of equal error and of equal ignorance. Everything is in place. You have the Greece, the, the big words of Greeks there, and they are in the doxa place, that is in the Aletheia place, that is in the Platonic place, that is in the Homeric place, in, ev in the Greek place, in the usual place. And the second sentence is beginning to Shift that. It is to the same man that belongs to speak straight and to refute those blaming Helen, a woman who gathers univocal and unanimous the belief of the poet's audience and the repute of a name which bears memory of calamities. I, myself, want, giving logic to Logos, to absolve from guilt this ill-reputed woman, demonstrate that blamers are wrong, show the truth, and put an end to ignorance. This is the new Helen coming. And it is possible because of the power of this course, because we are in full performativity, in full performance. Maybe I had to, um, to say that performativity in Austinian meaning is for me the the edge, the, the point, you know, of performance. Um, logos, discourse, reason, as you want to translate it, ratio and oratio. Logos has three possibilities. You speak to someone and you try to convince him, it's rhetoric. You speak of something and you demonstrate it, apodexis, and then you speak for speaking. You speak neither to nor for, but neither of nor for, but neither of something, neither for someone, but 
a third possibility. This third possibility is performativity, performance and performativity. Not demonstration philosophy, not re persuasion rhetoric, but a third kind of thing, Austin name performance, performativity. Third way of speaking. And this third way is what I find in the uh, paragraph eight, you know, of um, Helen Praise. Discourse is a great sovereign, logos dunastes megas estin, who by means of the smallest and least apparent of bodies, these are the terms that designate atoms, usually, uh, in the atomic uh, physics. Hmm? Avec le plus petit et le plus inapparent des corps, afanestato kai mix microtato somati. So it's atoms. Who, by means of the smallest and least appearance of bodies, performs, this is the way I choose to translate apotele, performs, the most divine of acts for it has the power to put an end to fear, push aside sadness, produce joy, increase pity. So this is the way Logos is uh, praised in Helen's praise. And um, this is, for me, the moment of uh, theorizing uh, as far as possible the performativity power of speech, apotele. It's a word effect, not persuasion, just as Plato um, um, has oh. used us to perceive sophistry. The sophists are the inventors of rhetoric and they persuade us. No, this is not the point. The point is that they make things discursively. Their discourse has a word effect. So, uh, Lyotard in the Différence says it like that, you see, it's not the addressee who is seduced by the addresser. The addresser, the referent, the sense, are no less subject than the addressee to the seduction exerted. That's how to extend rhetorical seduction to performance. And you see in Austinian terms what it means and how it is said. Locutionary is to speak of something, it's, and the value here is truth. Per locutionary is to speak to, it's just like rhetoric. If the first one was philosophy, this one is rhetoric. And it's by saying and you persuade. And the third and the new, the invention, invention, so-called invention, uh, so-called by Austin himself, his invention, but for me it has been already invented, for example, by Gorgias, hmm? the uh, Austinian thematization of this fine edge of performance, that's to say per performativity, elocutionary, it's uh, not truth, neither persuasion, but felicity or happiness, the, uh, um, the value. And um, happiness makes it as or not a word effect. When I say um, the session is open, if it's open, it's happy. If I am the judge, it's OK. And if I am not, and if I am the poor uh, audit auditor, uh, it's not open and it's not happy and it's not done. So, you see my, my, uh, my frame. It's what else then speak of, speak to, well, speak for the sake or for pleasure of speaking, perform, have a word effect. This is performance and uh, performativity. This is a, a, a new link, you see. Now, um, I propose you to, to go quite quickly on two contemporary practice of that, so just to have some examples. And then I will 
uh, be more long on psychoanalysis and Lacan's way of being sophist. So I propose you two contemporary practice. Uh, the first one is Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission in South Africa. And this is a performance that for a while has been happy. It makes, it makes, it has made the rainbow people by speeches, by cross speech, not only by that, but it was a, a very um, a dispositive, um, a happy dispositive, a tricky and clever dispositive. So we can speak of that uh, later on if you want, but I just want to point a sentence of Tutu um, in the report. It's a commonplace to treat language as mere words, not deeds. Therefore, language is taken to play a minimal role against violence. The Commission wishes to take a different view here. Language, discourse, and rhetoric does things. It constructs social categories, it gives orders, it persuades, it justifies, explains, gives reason, excuses. It constructs reality. It moves certain people against other people. You see, the point is it's always when you don't have the straight, the, the clear view of what performance and performativity is, um, all the um, sentences I will find. I will find, are a mix of rhetoric, of powers of rhetoric and performance. But for my, in my view, performance is really exceeding the Platonician, the Platonico-Aristotelian rhetorics. It's more than persuasion. It's more than uh, just um, uh, Effects. Uh, it's a w effects on the other people. It's word effect. Effect on the word, on the real, real effect. So language, discourse, and rhetoric does things, and effectively, they made uh, rainbow people at that moment, precise moment of post-apartheid and TRC. Uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And truth is just one possibility among others. And uh, there is a very interesting sentence in Tutu's report. He says, well, we don't mind historical truth, we don't mind uh, philosophical truth, we don't even mind, um, um, well, how do you say, uh, juridical truth. We just want enough of the truth for, enough of the truth for making rainbow people, for dealing with past, for using in real. That's an interesting point. Um, the second um, practice, the second sample, is our dictionary of untranslatables. For me, it has been um, well, if I can resume the purpose or the, the way of doing it, it's a sophistical performance emerged in tongues, in plurality of tongues, in diversity of tongues, in more than one tongue. What does a tongue make? What the diversity of tongues could make to philosophy and to word. Um, I just made two, two or three, two quotations or three quotations, some of Humboldt, some of Derrida, and some of Heidegger to contrast with, so you can see what point, what is my point here. So language, but you see how English is difficult. 
how do you translate langage? How do you translate langue? Hmm? It's the same word, so you have tongues, but it's not as easy. So language manifests itself in reality solely in terms of diversity will be a better translation, sorry. It's verschiedenheiten, diversity. Uh, it's a Humboldt sentence that has been used and reused by Heidegger, but not with the same meaning. The plurality or the diversity, say it, the diversity of languages is far from being reducible to diversity of ways of designating a thing, of designating a thing. There are different aspects of that same thing. And when the thing is not an object of the external senses, one is often dealing with as many things as are differently fashioned by each. Well, it's a kind of producer. La language and the difference of languages are producers. Si j'avais à risquer, Dieu m'en garde, une seule définition de la déconstruction, brève, elliptique, économique comme un mot d'ordre, je dirais sans phrase, plus d'une langue. Derrida. And to contrast with that, um, the way one tongue or one language is more real than another one, more philosophically pregnant and important and more... Um, more, well, uh, more more <laughs> than the others is uh, in Heidegger. The history of the basic word of Greek philosophy is an exemplary demonstration of the fact that the Greek language is philosophical. Not that Greek is loaded with philosophical terminology, but that it philosophizes in its basic structure and formation. The same applies to every genuine language in different degrees, to be, th to be sure, genuine put authentic, better translation. The extent to which this is so depends on the depth and power of the people who speak the language and exist within it. Only our German language has a deep and creative philosophical character to compare with the Greek. So our, my job with uh, the uh, uh, Dictionary of Untranslatable was at the same time philosophical and political. It was a neither nor job, neither globish nor ontological nationalism. Neither uh, every, everything in English, just like I do, that is no language, no tongue for me. I am very sorry, but I, I won't be better. Hmm? Uh, nor uh, ontological nationalism. Nor this Heideggerian depth of one language, Greek, and more Greek than Greek, German. Okay. So, this is the general framework, you know, of my, of my uh, <coughs> trying to displace, to shift the two false question. And I wish to now focus on uh, Lacan and on psychoanalysis as one of the sophistic practice, maybe the most, uh, the most up-to-date. And uh, the, the sentence of Lacan in uh, Seminar 12, psychoanalyst, the psychoanalyst, it is the presence of the sophist nowadays, but with another status. So that's my key sentence to try to understand what happens with, psych with Lacanian psychoanalysis. We can speak of Freudian too, but this will be another, another kind of talk. So, um, I'm sorry, I, I, I forgot to translate. <laughs> Maybe I am not able to. So, um, why Lacan, can, why does Lacan uh, say that? What, what it, does it mean, the presence of the sophist nowadays? but with another status. There are many, many reasons. Uh, one is that you pay 
and you pay the sophist and you pay to talk. This is a basic uh, resemblance. But, uh, and basic and important against philosophical, uh, you know, uh, always Plato and uh, Aristophan call sophists uh, ventre langue. They, their tongues is a, is a belly, is a belly. Mm. Um, but um, why, why does it, why a sophist and psychoanalyst are so linked in Lacanian way of seeing things? So I think there are um, three key words, logology, performance, and signifier. Logology means that um, what is um, real, what is first, and when you, when you say real, you put the guillemet, uh, is logos, speaking, you speak of logos, and logos speaks. And uh, moi la vérité, de, je parle, the, the key sentence of Lacan, I, truth, I, the truth I'm speaking, will be to interpret in this uh, space. Hmm? Um, so, logology against ontology. Logology, it could be um, expressed by this sentence of encore. There is no pre-discursive reality. Every reality is founded and defined by a discourse. This is in encore. Um, performativity is everywhere, but uh, let us pick up a sentence of the étourdi. Um, Qu'on dise that one speaks reste oublié derrière ce qui se dit dans ce qui s'entend is remains forgotten under what is said on in what is heard. But the fact of speaking, that is performance and performativity, this remains forgotten. That we speak is forgotten. And the, the third sentence about signifier, the signified is not what we heard. What you, what we heard, what we hear, is the signifying. The signify is the effect of the signifying. So you inverse the, as always in ontology logology process, you just inverse the sense of the flesh. You know, it's always like that. Uh, or let us say, being, sorry. Being, you speaking, you have being first and then you speak, and this is ontology. Or you have speaking speech first and then being is produced, and this is logology. So this is the performative or epidemic way of life, and this is the apodictic way of life. Very simple. How does it work? So, um, the signifier, well, I mean, the signifier is the effect the being is the effect of the signifying. Okay? Here you can put. Signifiant. Signifié. Usually you say that, but when you are like him, you say that. Why all this stuff? The main point 
is, um, I mean, the crux is Aristotle. How does Lacan used with Aristotle? And here I'm very sorry, but I cannot translate. This is not, I, I couldn't find the translation of the Etourdi in English, uh, but uh, I think it's, it will be very difficult to translate. Let us point the, um, it's uh, the beginning of page four. Read, I, I try to translate, <laughs> sorry. Read Aristotle's metaphysic, and I hope that, like me, you will feel it is vachement con. Really? Help? Really stupid. Even yeah, more than it is. <laughs> fucking dumb. <Sure>. Fucking, <laughs> it's fucking, but con, uh, it's, it's not, not any word. Yeah. <laughs> it's fucking fuck. <laughs> Three. <laughs> Three or four centuries after Aristotle, um, it has uh, people began to uh, doubt naturally um, about this text because uh, people still know how to read. I must say that Michelet is not the Michelet, you know, uh, it's an obscure man. Um, <laughs> is not, um, doesn't share this uh, view. And I do not either, because really, how can I say? The uh, fucking thing uh, is a proof of authenticity. Whatever could be written, if I can say meaningful, that's to say that has uh, that a touch with real. Aristotle um, is wondering about principle. Naturally, uh, he has no idea that the principle is this. There is no sexual, how do you say, relationship or uh, relationship. So the point is a <coughs> principle point. Are you Aristotelian or not? You, are not you don't need to be Lacanian not to be Aristotelian. I mean, you can be sophist. <laughs> but uh, the point is, do you believe, and how do you believe, in the non-contradiction principle? That is the point. Because when you uh, have a look on the way how Aristotle demonstrates the principle of non-contradiction, you begin aware that um, he made an equation that is absolutely not proved and not necessary about language. And that this, uh, without this equation, what I called um, the decision of meaning, without this equation, you cannot uh, be Aristotelian. That's to say, you cannot speak at all, and you are not a man. The point, that the point is that Aristotle conflagrates the way he speaks and the way we all speak and the possibility of being a man. Let, let us see it in the text. I, I've translated maybe not very well. It's a gamma for it's metaphysics, the demonstration, which is a refutation, of the principle of non-contradiction. Let me say it quickly, what, what is the dispositive? If you, Aristotle say, um, silly people, want, w without culture, wants me to demonstrate the principle of non-contradiction, of course it's impossible because it's a principle, but nevertheless, I can do it but not by the means of a direct demonstration, by the means of a refutation. It's, it's enough if the people who doesn't believe the principle speaks, utters a word. That's enough to demonstrate the principle. It's very, very tricky. Hmm? 
you say hello, and uh, well, you believe in the principle. If you say if you say hello, but you say hello to me, and you mean hello, well, hmm, you believe in the principle. You you are believing in the principle. Let me say how it is. Let us read together. So. Uh, let me begin, well, this, that to say the principle, could be demonstrated, um, as I begin the, the sentence uh, the way, even this can be demonstrated to be impossible. That's, that's it ref uh, sorry, it refers to the enoncé of the principle itself. Hmm? It is impossible that the same belong and not belong at the same time to the same thing. So, uh, let me say, um, I can demonstrate the principle in the manner of a refutation if only the disputant, the one who doesn't agree with principle, says something, an mononti lege, if he say something. If he says nothing, it is ridiculous to look what to say to one who does not say anything, insofar as he says nothing. Such a person, insofar as is, as is such, is similar to a vegetable, to a plant. So, if you speak, if you don't speak, you are not a man. So, you have to say something, okay? Because if you don't speak, you are a table, you are a plant, you are anything, but you are not a man. A man is an animal with logos, who speaks. So, if you speak, what do you do if you speak? You, um, I'm sorry, I think I cannot cut. So let us read the whole thing and then I will make the equivalences, okay? Um, if he says nothing, it is ridiculous to look what to say to one who does not say anything, insofar as he says nothing. Such a person, insofar as he says such, is similar to a vegetable. By demonstrating in the manner of a refutation, I mean something different from demonstrating, because in demonstrating, what might be thought to beg the original question. But if someone else is cause of such a thing, it must be refutation, not demonstration. In response to every case of that kind, the original step, begin here, is not to ask him to say that something either is or is not, for that might be well believed to be what it was originally at issue, but at least to signify something, both to himself and to someone else. For that is necessary if he has to say anything. For if he does not, there would be no speech for such a person, either in response to himself or to anyone else. But if he does offer this, there will be demonstration, for there will be already something definite. For not to signify one thing is to signify nothing. And if words do not, do not signify the possibility of dialogue with one another and to say the truth with oneself is destroyed. Sorry, you didn't understand anything. <laughs> That's why I want to make this point. Uh, I something like the blackboard. <laughs> you see how it is in this, in this long Greek quotation. Man is animal who legate, who speaks. If he doesn't speak, if, if you don't speak, you are not a man. You are a plant. Okay. Get away. So, what do you do when you speak? When you speak, <coughs> you say something. It's the same word in Greek, I'm sorry. It's not the same word in English. You say something. To say, to say, is to say something. Legen ti. To say something is <coughs> to say my name, something. To signify something. This is the equivalence. At least to signify something. When you signify something, you signify something for you, 
how to. And for the other one, how to, kai, hallo, signify something for you and for the other. <coughs> and how do you signify something for you and for the other? Only if you signify the same thing and one and the same thing. for you and for the other. So, or you are not German, or you speak. And if you speak, you say something. And if you say something, you signify something. And if you signify something, if you want to signify something, you must signify something and the same thing to you and to the other one, uh, to the other. Otherwise, you don't signify at all. If you don't signify him, <coughs> you don't signify if you because your word had no meaning. The point, you know, what is here said is that the meaning is found, the principle of non-contradiction is founded, is grounded on meaning, and the meaning is grounded of uh, the the total prohibition of homonymy. If you say hello, you don't say go to the devil. <laughs> or, or then you don't speak. You don't speak and you do something that is very bad. You speak Lobu Karim. You speak for the sake of the, for the pleasure of Logos, but not to signify. <coughs> this is the position of the sophist. He speaks Karim Logu outside the signification, the desire of meaning. This is the point. And this is the reading, the absolute clear, no, there is no other possibility when you read the Greek, you know, uh, on chapter 4 and chapter 5 of Gamma. And this is what Lacan did see absolutely perfectly, that this, all this discursive <coughs> problematic, you see, is the, well, not only philosophical, but the Normal, the, your and mine. When I speak to you, if I don't speak like that, you don't understand. Uh, even if I speak like that, maybe you don't. But <laughs> uh, uh, sure, if, uh, if, you, if I don't speak like that, you won't understand anything. I cannot speak to you, and I cannot speak to me if I don't speak like that. So that's the point. This is the principle of non-contradiction that is founded on the prohibition of the homonymy, which is as strict as the prohibition of the incest. And if you don't, well, you are outside. That's all. You are not a man. Um, how long do I have? Sorry? 15 minutes more. So. 15 minutes more? Okay. So, uh, this we can, uh, you see. See how it is. I think it's the heart of the, of the link between psychoanalysis and sophistic. Um, If I do that, this is the Aristotelian way of speaking. When I say home, 
Well, man. Oh, sorry. <laughs> When I say man, I say um, you, me, the man. I the 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 definition of essence. The word, the the meaning of the word is the essence of the thing. Let us say it like that. This is the heart of Aristotelian metaphysics. The definition of the word is the essence of the thing. Okay? This is the good uh, normal Aristotelian uh, philosophical way of speaking. If you want to go out of that, it's a bit complicated. This is the usual way of speaking. And um, here we find a strange thing. This was the goat's, the goat's tag of yesterday. There is, it's a meaning without a reference. Fiction. Here. It's possible. You can have words that has no reference. These are fiction. Goat's tag. Goat's tag. Bookset. It's a possibility of the semi-name T. You can semi-name without refer. Okay? You can have a meaning without referring. This is the perfect Aristotelian, very interesting, very complete, the perfect Aristotelian way of holding things and language. And here you have an outside. Legain, Logu, Karin. Speaking for the pleasure of speak, of, of speech, or speaking in pure loss, as you want, la say, speaking in pure loss. This is the sophists. They are performing, they are signifying with signifiers, and um, they are dealing every time with homonyms. Of course, here you can deal with homonyms, but what is the first gesture of a philosopher when he deals with homonym? He says, well, oh, he makes a dictionary. And delta, the dictionary, uh, Aristotle's dictionary, just follows gamma. Nobody say that, but it's absolutely clear. You know, uh, you, did, did you put the meanings of a word, one, two, three, four, as in dictionary, and when it's too difficult, you invent a new word. But you display the meanings so that nothing could be just a quiver. So here, uh, the practice, the usual practice, is a dictionary when it's in case of difficulty. And here, you have the space of fiction in this strange line. And here, you have the outside. The outside is sophistic and psychoanalyst. Um, let us quickly have a look on the. Well, I'm sorry. The Lacan's, the Lacan's sentences I quote from the Etourdi. I couldn't translate them, except the first one. A language, among others, is nothing more than the integral of equivocations which its history has left behind in it. This key sentence, this Lacanian key sentence is from the Etourdi. I repeat it. A language or a tongue, among others, is nothing more than the integral of equivocations, which is history of homonyms, if you want, which is history has left behind in it. That means that is valuable for the dictionary of untranslatable, that is valuable for the language, uh, for the 
tongues of the unconscious of in each of us that is valuable for the tongues, for the dictionary of untranslatable, for all the tongues. French is no more than the integral of the equivox. His history has left him. Let me just take an example. Uh, sens in French is meaning, sensation, and direction. This is not true of English. Sens is one of the, well, typical word of French. And when dictionaries, as Larousse could put, put three entries, well, they do like Aristotle, but they are wrong. If they are uh, historic, if they try to retrace it historically, you could see that uh, uh, there is one word, and only one, that uh, go through the Bible, through the translation of Luce, and then of census, and of course it's the same word. It diffracts, but it's the same word. And this is very important to understand what is a tongue. A tongue is the integral of the equivox. Its history is left in it. So, um, the point is, if I want to go back to the, diff to the sentence, to the Lacanian sentence I was starting, uh, the psychoanalyst is the sophist, is uh, nowadays, sophist of nowadays, but with another status. The other status is that now, if you are Lacanian, you know that the principle of non-contradiction is not the ground principle. It's vachement con, fucky thing. Because not enough fucky. Because uh, the real principle, the, re the true principle, is there is no sexual relationship. And, well, I left the topology of meaning that could drive us into Lacan a little bit too more, uh, too, too deep. But I just want to underline that, of course, you are now uh, not in meaning, but in interpretation. And interpretation deals on signifier, on equivox, and on, on, on performance. <coughs> And that's why Lacan found his new Aristotle, if you want, in Democritus. Democritus is the Lacanian, and I think that nobody uh, uh, sees that as well as Lacan. Uh, Democritus is absolutely uh, outstanding, uh, escaping all the traditions in the Greek philosophy. With his fiction of word, Wiesmann so that, so that, Heinz Wiesmann, with his fiction of word, den. Den is not something, it's the name of the atom, but it means it's not a word you can find in Greek. I mean, it's an apex. Democritus is the only one that could find it, that could that use it. And then is a pure signifier. It is the produce of of what I can call a bad cat. A false cut. Because you see, medal means not one, or uden, this negation, nothing, means not one. It's like that. Mede hem. Ude hem. If you are cutting well the word medem, you are cutting med hem. Good hem, like that. When you are cutting, then you are making an absolutely impossible thing in Greece. 
That's in Greek. That's why you don't find the word. There is a false cut, just as if wanting to see. You see, you have no <coughs> thing in, in, or anything in English. Just as if I was cutting like that. No, well, it's too hard, like that. <laughs> Not him. And I say, instead of that, I say, ping. Or ping. Or, uh, no, ping is <laughs> <laughs> So, you see, it's not a word. It's a pure <coughs> signifier. It's a signifier and a signifier. And um, Lacan says that this then is, uh, how do you say, passager clandestin? Um, stowaway. Stowaway. <laughs> the stowaway of the whole ontology. And he uh, uh, made a last poem saying that democratic, democratic materialism is a materialism. Mo here is word. Hmm? Matter, word. Materialism, democratic materialism is nothing but a materialism, a worldarialism. So, I will stop here, not to be, I'm, I've already been uh, too long, but you see how um, sophistical practice can, um, can be uh, understood not with a truth false cut, but with a meaning cut <coughs> that will be more, maybe more interesting, less Platonician, more Aristotelian, and more I interesting. And um, that by this way, we can focus on equivoques, homonyms, and interpretation. Thank you.